Hello and thank you all for viewing. This is the second part of my two-part series on the multimodality appearance of adnexal torsion. Learning objectives are to review the ultrasound appearance of adnexal torsion, review multiple examples of adnexal torsion on CT, and review multiple examples of adnexal torsion on MRI. So in a twist of the usual case conference, here there is no doubt as to the diagnosis. It's all adnexal torsion. I hope after reviewing this collection of cases, we can all find and call torsion earlier, and more definitively however it comes to us, whether it's on CT, ultrasound, or MRI. The nice thing about this collection is the way we can correlate each example with another modality. We'll also review the common imaging features to look for, though I'd refer you to the first part of this talk for more details. The major findings I want you to keep in mind are ovarian enlargement and edema, which are the most common and most helpful, with abnormal ovarian positioning and swirling of the adnexa as being less common but highly specific for adnexal torsion. Knowing the ultrasound findings, which we're all much more familiar with, we can translate that to CT, which is helpful especially for emergency departments with limited ultrasound availability and for patients with nonspecific or confounding symptoms that are scanned to rule out other pathologies. Again, the ovary is enlarged and may be midline, seen in 87 to 100% of cases. A benign lead mass with smooth, regular wall thickening is seen in 52 to 93% of cases. A twisted pedicle or a whirlpool sign can be seen in 31 to 100% of cases. Pedicle soft tissue thickening can be seen in 17 to 97% of cases. The uterus can also be pulled to one side and adnexal stranding, a small amount of free fluid, can be seen in 40 to 73 percent of cases. In our first case, this axial non-contrast CT for flank pain shows an enlarged right ovary surrounded by the red circle, abnormally positioned in the midline of the pelvis. The green arrow demonstrates the normal size and location of the left ovary, as well as free fluid. I want you to get used to finding each ovary on CT to get an idea of its typical location and appearance. So as we go over these cases, keep an eye out for the normal ovary as sort of an internal control. So here is the full CT with some distractors, and you know I love my distractors. We have splenic granulomas, changes of a ruin y gastric bypass, and as we get lower down, we see the midline pelvic mass which is the torsed right ovary. There's internal high density compatible with hemorrhage and a marker of non-viability. The green arrow just shows us the free fluid again with the adjacent normal appearing left ovary. Here is a quick ultrasound correlation with just a single grayscale image showing the ovarian enlargement, the internal hemorrhage, and adjacent free fluid all in one image the color Doppler from the same section of the ovary shows no internal flow. Remember the finding of no internal flow is best seen as a marker of non-viability. If we wait to call torsion until there's no internal flow, we would not salvage a single ovary. Moving on to our next case of torsion shown initially on CT. The red circle surrounds the enlarged and pretty hyperdense left ovary with surrounding free fluid. Some more free fluid, typically more than you would expect in a reproductive age woman, showing the same findings coronally. And coronals can really be helpful to get an idea of ovarian size, and if you're really lucky, you might see an adnexal twist. Here's the full non contrast CT, showing the full extent of the pelvic free fluid. As we get down to the pelvis, we see the enlarged and torsed left ovary right here, surrounded by the red circle with the adjacent free fluid. Coronal reformatted images showing us the same thing.
grayscale ultrasound images showing complex free fluids surrounding the left ovary. You see the left ovary is enlarged. Color Doppler showing no convincing internal flow. What I mean by that is there's a dot of color here, but that's really nothing beyond what's shown in the background and more typical of noise than real blood flow. Now here we have an internal arterial waveform and another waveform, less consistent, but looks like real internal color flow. Do not be reassured this is still adnexal torsion. There's no need to equivocate. Call a torsion, call the ordering provider, and let them know. This is an ovary that could potentially be salvaged. On to our third case. Our superior most slice from this contrast enhanced CT scan shows what I consider to be a very important first clue that you're looking at a positive case, especially in female patients where a certain amount of physiologic free fluid is common and expected, as opposed to men where any amount of free fluid is abnormal. And that's complex free fluid in Morrison's pouch. That amount of blood in a female patient is more than typical or normal that you would expect to see in normal follicle rupture. And when it's this much, it already meets my threshold to call and let the clinician know about how much blood there is. Keep an eye out for this clue on ultrasound as well. A lot of scanning protocols will take a quick look at one or both kidneys, and it can really ring the alarm early for potentially hemodynamically significant amount of blood. The red circle shows the enlarged right ovary. The rim of contrast density at the periphery of the ovary showing active hemorrhage. So we have an enlarged bleeding ovary with hemoperitoneum. We already know this is a torsed ovary and the hemoperitoneum is a marker of non-viability. Here's the full CT scan. Here we see the complex free fluid making its way to the abdomen, both lower quadrants, and we see the torus and enlarged right ovary. Our grayscale ultrasound shows an enlarged ovary with a volume of about 52 cc's. Normal ovarian volume should be less than 10. Just a reminder that if it's not done for you, you can calculate the ovarian volume by multiplying each dimension, A times B times C times 0.52. Again, a unilaterally enlarged ovary is our best indicator for torsion on any modality. As we expect with the CT appearance, there's no internal color flow and no internal waveform. This is a torus ovary that's unlikely to be salvageable in surgery. Here's our last CT case with an ultrasound correlate. Axial non-contrast CT images show the left ovary is enlarged with adjacent free fluid. The green circle shows the normal appearing right ovary. Here's a full CT scan to get an idea of the enlarged left ovary, as well as just sort of its general position, which is higher than what would be expected. Hepatocytosis, postcholecystectomy. As we get into the pelvis, we start seeing the enlarged left ovary pretty high up. Same on coronal. The abnormal ovary is in the red circle, and the normal right ovary is in the green circle. Coronals really help get an idea of just how large that ovary is. Which sometimes actually going slice by slice, you can kind of lose sight of that. Grayscale images show a massively enlarged left ovary with a volume of 130 cc's. Color images and spectral Doppler. with no real consistent internal blood flow. This ovary is torsed and not salvageable. Case five. So here's the second scan of the day for this patient after presenting 12 hours earlier
with abdominal pain and a, quote, negative CT. Unfortunately, the earlier scan and ultrasound correlation aren't available, but I think this case still demonstrates how important it is to specifically look for and evaluate the adnexa and female pelvis on every CT. This sagittal image shows the enlarged right ovary, which is high. Here's a full CT showing a lot of distractors, bilateral renal stones. And again, a lot of these scans are done for flank pain, left hydronephrosis, all to lull you into a false sense of security. But here is the main problem, the enlarged right ovary, which is high, surrounded by fluid, compatible with torsion. Sagittal reformats, just to stress how important reformats can be to show the thickened and twisted adnexa. Leaving no doubt that this is ovarian torsion. Let's move on to some MRI examples with either ultrasound or CT correlate. To review, the MRI findings of torsion are basically the same as CT, with an enlarged, abnormally positioned ovary being the most reliable, closely followed by edema, which manifests as increased T2 signal on CT. The soft tissue resolution is really key for identifying the edematous ovary. These two axial T2 weighted images show just how big the left ovary is relative to the adjacent right ovary. The coronal image shows the swirling of the adnexa, which again is highly specific for adnexal torsion. Here's the full axial T2 fat saturated sequence showing the enlarged edematous left ovary within the red circle with the adjacent twisted pedicle. Here's the coronal T2 showing the same findings with the red circle highlighting the twisted pedicle. Nice classic whirlpool appearance, leaving no doubt that this is that nexal torsion. Here's the ultrasound correlate for the twisting of the pedicle. Let's follow this loop. You can see the red circle showing the twisted pedicle. Our next MRI case is from a reproductive age woman with an intrauterine first trimester pregnancy. MRI is becoming more common in the emergent setting, especially in pregnant patients, and I cannot stress how important it is to evaluate the ovaries in these patients, most of which come in with a rule out appendicitis history in my experience. The axial T2 fat saturated image shows an intrauterine first trimester gestation with a thickened left adnexa and left adnexal free fluid. The coronal image shows the enlarged left ovary with a twisted pedicle and adjacent fluid. Here's the full sequence. That enlarged ovary and twisted pedicle is enough to call it torsion. No need to correlate with ultrasound, no doubt. But ultrasound has usually performed anyway, which may either be done first or second. So let's see what the ultrasound shows. Here, the left ovary is massively enlarged with a calculated volume of 180 cc's. Spectral Doppler again shows internal flow. Don't let this push you off the diagnosis. Torsion must be considered for any unilaterally massively enlarged ovary in a woman with acute pelvic pain. Here's our last case with CT followed by MRI. Multiple distractors in this case of an elderly woman, including renal stone disease and ureteral enhancement, marked fecal impaction, a right ovary with a cystic mass, and a decubitus ulcer. The key to this case is seeing what we think is the right ovary is not the right ovary. That's the right ovary. The right pelvic mass is actually the enlarged torsed left ovary. So let's look at the full CT. Again, we see all the distractors, renal stone disease, collecting system enhancement, sinusally descended colon, Lots of reasons for pain and lots of things to push you off your diagnosis. 
here we see the abnormally positioned left ovary consistent with torsion. These axial T2 fat saturated images show both ovaries with the superior tissue resolution you would expect with MRI. On our first slice, superiorly, we see the torsed and abnormally positioned left ovary, which is now in the right pelvis. Below that, we see the normal appearing and small sized right ovary where you'd expect it. Here is the full T2 fat saturated sequence. You see the normal right ovary, and then you see the enlarged left ovary below it. Thanks again for viewing, and check out part one if you haven't already. For more detail on the multimodality appearance of adnexal torsion, where I go over in more detail the ultrasound CT and MRI findings.